sorry. I forgot to speak for you. My name is Aubrey Hicks, and um, I'm the assistant director of the Judith and John Georgian Center on Governance and the Public Enterprise. Um, every week, for the past couple of months, we, the Georgian Center, along with the um, Jesse and Under Institute of Politics, and the Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy, we've been holding the Road to the White House series. Um, we gather and talk about election issues, uh, facing local voters, um, and the political campaigns. Um, we had some very interesting talks, and today we're going to talk about uh, the future of the federal transport policy. Um, transportation is one of those issues that affect us all. And we think we know something about policy issues. Um, it's a part of our everyday language here in LA. I think we talk more about transportation than any place I've ever lived. Um, <laughs> we talk about the 101, the 5. Um, we talk about uh, traffic. Um, um, transit is vital to our economy, but more importantly, it's uh, vital to our everyday lives. So, um, even though it's a part of our everyday lives, we don't really know how policy affects us. So, today we brought together a great panel. Um, they're going to talk about these transportation issues on the federal level that affect us every day. So, I want to thank our panelists for joining us. We have a uh, PhD candidate, Mojo Rhodes, Master's of Public Policy candidate, Teddy Minch and Associate Professor Lisa Schweitzer. And Lisa, if you could start us off with introducing yourself. Sure. Can we start? Sure. Okay. Okay. Do you want to start? Okay. Um, well, I'm an associate professor over in the Price School, and we actually have a lot of events on transportation over there, so if you have a particular interest in it, please just email me, and I will see if I can get you on our mailing list so that you can come and attend all of our talks, because uh, we have some really good ones. Um, so one of the things I'm going to start us off is to try to get you to understand how transportation became a partisan issue. Um, back when I was your age, a long time ago and longer than I care to think about, uh, I started working in transportation and it was primarily a technical field, right? It was a technical policy field that was dominated by engineers and to a lesser degree by economists. But for the most part, we had a general consensus about what the federal role in transportation was. Back in 1956, um, we had passed a, na a national or a federal gas tax with the express purpose and the agreement that that money was going to go into something called the Highway Trust Fund. And while it was a controversial uh, question at the time, once it was passed, uh, the controversies arose primarily at the local level when people started resisting uh, the building of the freeways. But for the most part, there was consensus at the federal level that that money was meant to go for the highway system. Right? So we had a consensus roughly from then until about 1980 to 1986. Right? And people disagree on when the consensus really started to break down. But can anybody guess as to why the, the consensus broke down? Anybody want to shout out a guess for me? Well, Reagan was elected. Well, Reagan was elected, but we finished. Right? That's pretty much what happened, is we got our national highway system finished. Now, there are certain little links of it that we're never probably going to get finished. Right, like some cars in Southern California. But we finished. And we still had the federal gas tax. And so, you know, a lot of folks said, okie dokie then. Right? What do we need the gas tax for now? <laughs> right? We're still collecting the monies. Uh, but we, we pretty much did what we set out to do. And so maybe what we should do is just get rid of the federal gas tax. It'd be nice to save some money. The states now should be controlling most of the little links of the national highway system. They should be controlled and maintaining it. Let's just let it go, right? And that was one of the things that Ronald Reagan was sort of a centerpiece of his transportation policy when he started. He ended up in a different place. But one of his ideas was we're just going to devolve all of this policy responsibility back to the states. Because the feds don't need to be in everybody's business, right? Now, another group said, no, 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 no. We have all of this money that we're collecting at the federal level. There's a whole bunch of transportation need that still exists. So what we'll do is we'll use that money for things like transit projects, for maintaining roads that we need to maintain, for building bridges or rebuilding bridges. And in 1992, 
right? We passed the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, which was a watermark year for all of those folks who were like, you know, what we really need to do is we need to get federal money for transit. Transit's really important to our cities, right? And we will use that federal gas tax money to help cities build better transit systems. That's what we do in the post-interstate era, okay? Now, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act is what's called a reauthorization bill. For those of you who are tech and political science part people, you'll understand that that's basically a spending bill. And for years of transportation, these came up every four years. It was like the sun rising in the east, right? There'd be some typical budgetary hair pulling that you're always used to, you know, Wyoming, Martin List, and North Carolina, and that, et cetera, et cetera. But we also had some general agreement that this was going to be spent on highways. This is called ICT, according to all the like, acronym lingo that transportation people use all the time. With ICT, it was really the first year that we cracked open the Highway Trust Fund, right, for use on urban transit, right, the Highway Trust Fund that we dedicated all of the federal gas tax revenues to. And with that, right, many people thought we had ushered in a new era of federal transportation involvement, um, one where the federal government was going to help cities build the sort of transit systems they, they want to have, reduce the risks associated with these big capital cost investments. And our own expo line, for example, out here, got a big boost of money from the federal government as a way of trying to help cities build more and better transit. And we sort of hobbled along with that for a while. Transit people, urban people in particular, were very happy right, with the outcome of ICT. We had more bills every four years, but every single one of them got harder to pass. Right after ICT, I think that something else was old in the room. Was it? It wasn't. It was um, safety. Alert? Was safety alert next? No, T21. T twenty one. Yeah, T twenty one, and they all have these ridiculous acronyms, right? But they're all spending bills. It's all how to spend money for the next four years. Right? So there was T twenty one and safety loop, and each of those got harder and harder to pass because it wasn't sort of arguments on what kind of you know highway projects we should spend money on, it became arguments about how much money the highway people get, how much money the transit people get, ooh, how much money the bus people get versus how much money the rail people get, and ooh, can we find a way to open up the federal coffers for sidewalks and other really important things in cities that we like. We sort of stumbled along doing this for a while, even though know, each one of those bills became progressively harder and more and more partisan as time wore on. But then in 2009, we ran into a big problem. We haven't raised the federal gas tax since 1992. And so in 2009, the Highway Trust Fund actually ran a $9 million deficit. We ran short. Um, we, we sort of dealt with the whole fact that we haven't increased the tax or we haven't indexed it for inflation. Just because, you know, it was a boom economy for a large part of the 2000s. People were driving. People were driving dumb vehicles that consumed a lot of gas at big expeditions and whatnot. And so we, we sort of glided by them. But then when we hit the red, right, we were at a point where we were really spending more than we could out of this fund. Um, the political firestorm became much harder. And the partisanship that had been growing, I think, arguably since 1987, really took off after 1992. And then in 2009, it just splintered in ways we had never really experienced in transportation before. So now what? Now what do we do? Right, that's the policy question in front of us. Well, we could raise the federal gas tax, hasn't been done since 1983. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of an innocent. Tax proposals, how are they faring? <laughs> right? So when, when you know, Obama and his Secretary of Transportation, Ray Hood, were, were offered that advice back in 2009, uh, Hood's response was sort of, We'll get back to you on that. that, right? Didn't want to go there. Um, the other thing is to cut the federal role, right? Just authorize fewer programs, authorize fewer projects. That simple. We'll just reduce the federal role in transport, which many people, since the end of the interstate, have sort of said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, or we can take money out of the general fund to make up the deficit that we've had since 2009. So of, the, of these, which ones do we think happen? Here, I, I've got one taker over there, right? We've been taking money out of the general fund to make up the deficit. Um, in addition to taking money 
out of the general fund for transportation for the first time, uh, really in, in modern history. Um, Obama is one of those presidents who just, you can't shut him up about infrastructure. He really is interested in it. And he thinks it's a really important policy field. Um, so one of the centerpieces of his State of the Union a few years ago was high-speed rail. Now, again, I've been at this rodeo for a good long time. It used to be that high-speed rail was a bipartisan issue. Right? There were plenty of Republicans who wanted high-speed rail and who advocated for it. And then all of a sudden, right, when he took that to be a centerpiece of his legislation or part of his agenda at the federal level, whoosh, you started to see Republican governors reacting very strongly, right, and treating the high-speed rail really as a symbol of how out of touch this president was, right, with like how much financial trouble the country really was in, right. This is, this is a symbol, and I'm not saying that these are my politics, by the way, I'm just trying to describe what I see. This is a symbol of how clueless liberals do not understand that you can't spend and spend and spend, right, when you don't have the money to back it up. Um, the other thing is that he's really been unabashedly an urban president. He's from Chicago, he's, and, and his Secretary of Transportation also has been very high on rhetoric that focuses on urban transportation issues like transit, like walking, like biking. Um, those types of projects are, are really key to urban areas like Los Angeles, but they don't resonate with voters who don't live in cities. And there are a lot of people in the United States who still don't live in cities or who live in suburbs, right? And so that's one of those things that doesn't necessarily play very well with certain parts of the constituency. Um, it's very clear that his economic advisors are Keynesians and traditional Keynesians, right, who say, look, if you want to help us out of the recession, infrastructure spending is a way to do that, right? Infrastructure is a, 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 something that fosters capital growth. It's a way of doing public investment that puts people to work right away. And you need to have a solid core of infrastructure in order for other businesses to grow. So that's been a centerpiece of his sort of economic recovery plan. If you guys remember the infrastructure bill from last year, that didn't really go anywhere. So a big believer in this idea that this is a way to put people back to work when they're having economic hard times. The other thing that he's been really interested in is a federal infrastructure bank, which is, hasn't been uncontroversial, simply because there are large portions of people on the right, in particular in some of the center, who sort of look at a federal infrastructure bank and aren't really sure about what that would mean given Freddie Mae and, well, given, given Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? Concerns that another GSA, a government-sponsored agency, only focused on transportation would do some of the things for the market in transportation that they think those agencies, the uh, Freddie and Fannie, had on distorting the housing market in the United States, which we're now sort of reeling from the bubble with. And so these three points essentially galvanized or balkanized opposition to much of what Obama was looking to do with his transportation agenda, right? We got to a point where, you know, this really sort of describes what happened when we started to try to roll out high-speed rail money to states, is that Republican governors made a media circus out of turning that money down as a way of symbolically going, hey, my policy is to be prudent, right? Where fiscal, fiscal prudence says you don't spend money like this when you don't have a good solid business plan I'm not convinced that this is a smart investment, so you just keep your money. I'm going to walk away from those federal billions, right? And it, in some respects, um, it, it's very, very surprising because it's not typical for it's not typical for politicians to walk away from money. It's just not, no matter what side of the aisle is on. So let's take a look at some of the Republicans in the field and what their interest in infrastructure have been. Um, you know, one of the great things about being interested in infrastructure and transportation is that both sides of the aisle love it, right? I'll never be out of a job, right? Um, this is uh, Mitt Romney, um, and here's a quote from him, and I've tried to be really fair in the quotes that I've picked, because um, I don't like people to quote out of context. Um, you know, he basically says, look, having good roads and bridges and rail lines and air traffic lines is essential for a strong economy. I'm willing to invest in those things and even borrow in some circumstances if there is going to be a good revenue stream. Right? This is a straight up moderate statement. <laughs> there's, there's nothing sort of radical about what he's saying here. Would, would you like to comment on that, Dalton? Sure. I mean, I think that you have 
you have a wide variety of, of individuals who have run and are running right now who, for them, this would be so far left of yeah. where they are. This would be off the map. This would be like in a whole separate area. And, and Mitt Romney, this, and we can get to this later, I guess, when we go more to question and answers, a lot of this probably stems from his record in Massachusetts having to operate under very tight constraints given what the big dig had done to state finances and state finances available uh, for capital budgeting and transportation spending at the time. So definitely, yes. Well, one of the questions that I would ask for you is, when you say that this beast sort of far to the left, are you talking about the part where he talks about borrowing? <laughs> yes, in isolation from the revenue streams part, which, if you look at the left, is very far to the right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Ron Paul has, um, in some respects, a pretty interesting candidate when it comes to infrastructure and his own, um, his own uh, behavior as a politician over the last decades. Um, where he just says, look, before we, infrastructure is important. It should be prioritized over all of these other things, you know. Um, before subsidies, welfare payments, social security, uh, bridges to nowhere, all these other things, entire countries bond and rebuild. Um, any other sort of hoopy doodle and, and whatnot, or jiggery pokery that you do at the federal level, um, infrastructure should be attended to and taken seriously. So these two are actually very different candidates when you've been following them for a while. And both of them are saying the same thing, and that is that infrastructure is important. So we do have some common you know, understanding across the board that this is really a significant policy field, and where the real disagreements come in is what types of modes are important and who, where should the funding happen, right? And so um, Paul has been very famous about pointing out in, in his home state of Texas, he was a very vocal opponent of Rick Perry's um, big Texas turnpike project. Um, simply because he viewed it, and not incorrectly, <laughs> as a situation where the costs were socialized but the benefits were privatized. With these very large mega projects, the temptation, and this is not just an American funding, not, it's happened around the world, where basically taxpayers pay for all the capital costs, and then whatever it is is handed over to a private entity to run. And so they get to, they get to have the revenues while we've eaten the costs. And so he's been very vocal about stuff like that. Um, Newt Gingrich, you can't say that Newt is not interesting, <laughs> <laughs> right? And he's one of those people who's been around for a good long time, and you can sort of look at his, his own behavior with regard to infrastructure um, policy as sort of an indicator of what's happened in the GOP. Uh, in particular, as transportation has become more politi politicized. But this is back in 2009. This isn't even way back in the day. This is in 2009. He gave a speech on eight principles of infrastructure, some of which are sort of hardcore conservative principles, but another, others of which are sort of a go big or go home attitude, <laughs> right? Which is, if we're in a gold high speed rail, it needs to be big, and it needs to be fast, and it needs to be better than what the Chinese have done, right? So he's been a long-term advocate of high speed rail. Um, you, can, you, can't, you can't have the world's most productive society in the world with a crumbling infrastructure. Again, infrastructure is important. Uh, the number two goal should be mega structures, right? Go big or go home, do these investments, do them the right way, get the top of the line technology, right? That's his message. And in some respects, it's a pretty big message, right? It's bold, it's, you know, we're not going to do things in half measures, we're going to spend the money and we're going to do it right, right? Now, in 2012, right? He's gotten more into this practice of sort of treating a lot of what the president's um, priorities have been as part of more of a culture war argument, right? Liberals don't like us having bigger vehicles, don't like us liking bigger vehicles, so they want to find a way to punish us economically. Hit our pocketbook, make us change, because they all, they'd like all of us to live in big cities and high rises, taking mass transit, right? Now you can directly tie that to a lot of the language that the White House has put out there about smart growth, about density, about livability and sustainability, right? Those are, in reality, very urban dialogues. Those are very urban policy dialogues. And here, you're just speaking to a constituency of people who just don't want to live in cities, right? And they may, in fact, see people who live in cities, like New York and Boston and D.C., right, as urban elite. Right, the urban policy elite with their Boston, you know, their Boston connection, their Harvard degrees, who are in no way in touch with the type of transportation needs that we have out in rural X. Right? Rick Santorum has done this when it came to <laughs> um, 
he, he's, you know, he's, he's an experienced senator. He really hasn't entered into the fray. And it's a very smart thing for him to do. Um, he's not running as a managerial candidate, right? He's not running as somebody who really wants to talk about sort of a bureaucratic vision for managing the country or managing its infrastructure. He's running based on sort of social values, right? And he knows that what, what unites his groups, the people who are voting for him, are his very strong stance that this is, these are my values, these are the values that I think this country, that hold this country together. And so if he does sort of enter into the foray of infrastructure, he's actually likely to annoy those people. Because there's no reason to assume that, that those folks are going to have the same feelings about what our transportation priorities should be. And right now they have a consensus on what our values should be. So he's sort of kept out of that. Right? He's been pretty smart about that. Um, but if you've watched the um, if you've watched the debates, as I do, because I'm a complete junkie, right? Um, where he sort of got into trouble, and then they all started poking each other in the eyeballs about this, right? Was earmarks, right? Because everybody hates everybody else's earmarks. My earmarks are good and efficient and wonderful. Your earmarks are stinky and a waste of money, right? Your earmarks are political pandering. And so that's going to be one of our hot button issues that I'm going to try to lead you to think about. So, my young friends, Every four years, we used to be able to expect a transportation reauthorization bill like the sun rising in the east. Um, we haven't had it. How late are we? Two years? Three years? Two, 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 it's two, 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 and two and a half years now. I don't even start counting. Yeah. Um, we cannot get a consensus on what the next T21 safety move, TT, whatever we're going to call it this time out, kind of thing. And basically, we've just been passing one extension after another because nobody knows how to close that deficit in the Highway Trust Fund. Um, so the House bill, right? The House bill was the first to come out. It's the originating body and that's important. The Republicans in the House put together a bill that just sent the urban blogosphere into conditions. Basically because it eliminated earmarks and it cut transit, walking, and biking funding out of the Highway Trust Fund entirely. They said, okay, the way we're going to close the deficit is we're going to stop trying to fund things they're largely urban transportation priorities out of the Federal Highway Trust Fund. And if people want that, they can treat that as something that comes out of general revenues. Right? Now, it's not that big of a change from what we're actually doing now, given the, <laughs> right, given the location of some of our transit funding and the fact that we have to keep scooping money out of the federal government, out of the, out of the general funds, uh, to, to deal with our deficit. Um, but it was a big deal symbolically to people who are sort of urban politics folks. There was a feature length uh, bit in the Atlantic Cities from William Doyle talking about, you know, the war on urbanites <laughs> that this represented. Um, one of my least favorite journalistic conventions is to describe opposition as war. And I'm like, war involves bombs and death and guns, right? Taking away your transit funding is not the same <laughs> as that. But anyway, um, and, and sort of explicitly said, this is paving the way for a reduced federal role, okay? The White House, um, you know, these are very smart politicians, and Obama is a very smart politician. These folks know full well we're probably not going to pass anything this year, and so he used this as an opportunity to sort of say, okay, let's roll out a budget that puts a lot of money in transit, <laughs> right? <laughs> that just takes money out of the general fund and puts it on these sort of primarily trained-based priorities that he's been really interested in knowing full well that we're, we're not going to reach a consensus, but as a way of sort of establishing, these are my values, these are my priorities, and this is why you should vote for me. Right? Because he's elect it's an election year, he's got a campaign. And it was, of course, done on rival everywhere. Boxer's bill, the Senate bill, which recently passed to a great deal of hoopla, um, eliminated earmarks. Right? It's a big concession, I think, and it's a big olive branch to the House was that they eliminated most earmarks. There's some kind of hidden way in there. You really have to look at the, the fine print to see them. But it got rid of earmarks. Um, it did maintain transit funding. Um, some cuts, but didn't really address how we were going to close the deficit. And it's essentially another extension for all practical purposes. It's not another, you can't expect another four-year bill out of this. And it's passed, but the rumblings from the House are that they're not even going to consider it. Right? They're not even going to try. So chances are in April what we're going to be doing is we're going to see another just basic extension of what we're doing right now. The problem with that is that next year um, the Highway Trust Fund is going to be officially bankrupt. Right? We can't keep passing these extensions. So the hot button issues that you guys should be thinking about 
Um, and I can't tell you what the right way to think about these things are because some of them just come down to your own values and feelings about what the appropriate roles of different levels of government are. That's my time. Sorry. Um, you know the earmarks. As I said, everybody hates everybody else's earmarks. But at the federal level, it is very hard for infrastructure to work without them. There are some compelling reasons to want them. But more than anything, I don't see us being able to pass any of these bills without earmarks. They were the ways in which politicians traded chits. And so when you saw in the Republican debates them starting to work on Rick Santorum, and then they sort of pushed back on it, and ooh, you know, the only one in that room who really could say that his hands were clean when it came to earmarks was Ron Paul. And he's from a district that wasn't likely to get an earmark anyway. Right? I mean, earmarks kind of make the budgetary wheels roll in infrastructure, and there's a bunch of compelling reasons for them. Particularly if you are from a place like California, where, because there are so many Californians, our actual contribution to the federal gas tax is more than what we get out in terms of programs. We're what we call donor state. And earmarks are one of the ways that you keep donor states at the table. Right? So if you take those away, places like Ohio and Texas and California and New York are sort of like, why am I doing this? Right? Why are we doing this? The highway trust fund deficit is, as I pointed out, a very big deal. The Federal Infrastructure Bank question, um, Barbara Boxer's um, Senate bill did try to establish a provision for starting down that road without actually calling it an infrastructure bank. Um, but again, that bill's not going to go anywhere. So if this is a, an idea that's kind of a party perennial at the federal level. Um, the urban versus rural states and the donors the recipients relationships. Right? And the bottom line that many people just don't think there's a federal role in transit. Right? There are many people who are like, if New York City wants more transit, why can't New York City pay for its own transit? If Californians want more transit, why can't they raise their own gas tax and build their own transit? Right? That's the argument. A strong emphasis from the right in particular on user fees, like tolls and fares and ticket sales, rather than taxes. Right? Nobody really wants to touch the gas tax, but if you don't, how do you raise money? Well, the argument is user fees. Let more private companies come in, privatize a road, let people charge people to drive on. Um, and then finally, you know, some basic questions about is there any federal role left other than sort of security and sort of the standard things that you associate with the federal government? Um, or whether or not the, highway, um, the federal highway system is done, we should just retire the whole shebang and let states and, and regions run, run the show. Lastly, this is sort of a throw in, gas prices. I'm not entirely sure how the president became responsible for gas prices. <laughs> um, but somehow he is. And um, it's, it's a big deal for American voters, uh, particularly for American voters who live in the suburbs and who live outside of <clears throat> urban areas. And so unless something changes, and it usually does, gas prices usually go down in the summer, right, at the end of the summer for all sorts of reasons. Um, this could continue to sort of be a big problem for, for him, particularly if it affects the sort of little green spring of the economic recovery. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask Moshe if she'd like to toss anything in and then probably ask questions. Um, can you speak to what is the benefit of the federal role? You know, uh, let, me, let, me, let me do a couple of things. Um, let me, raise my right hand when I'm talking for the GOP side and I'll raise my left hand when I'm talking for Democrats. So I'm going to talk Democrats here for the most part, Democrats and liberals. You know, on the liberal side, one of the major things that um, comes out in the sort of response to the House bill was cities are important, cities are important, cities are important, right? It's a, it's a feeling of that essentially that a unified urban policy at the federal level is a value statement, right? That we want to support urban transit for a variety of reasons. And if you actually want Republicans to listen to you, you don't start with global warming. You start with something else, right? Or the environment, or any of the other hundreds of reasons why we've sold public transit, except as actual mobility. Okay, so if you're that, right, you believe that it's, it's like civil rights, it's like environmental regulation. It's a fundamental value that we have in the United States, and that's why we want it. 
codified at the federal level. Um, because in reality, my response to Dwight was, when he wrote about the war on urbanites, was, you know, it's not really, it's not that anybody's anti-transit, it's that they're anti-federal. <coughs> Right? And the message is, if you want to have transit in your city, go have transit in your city. Don't wait around for federal handouts. So, on the right, the, um, there are some arguments over here that the bottom line is, the more you devolve that responsibility away from the feds, the more local control you get. Right? And ultimately, all to the better for transit overall. Right? At the federal level, what you end up doing is spreading the money across political boundaries in ways that don't necessarily make sense. You end up in, with bus rapid transit in Idaho, where there's nobody taking it. Um, and then if you just roll all that back, places that actually need more transit would be better off. Like if you returned California's source money to California, you could actually buy more transit in California instead of using that money to redistribute across states. The other major argument um, is a risk spreading argument. Teddy, you want to give the risk spreading argument because I know we've argued it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, and, you know, obviously jump in if I'm leaving things out. But the, the idea, at least behind the federal government's role in uh, transportation from a financing point of view, is that if you collect revenues from gas taxes, or, you know, we can look at any other variety of things, but for now it's the gas tax, you have sort of a, a centralized nexus of a lot of money, a lot of money. Not always enough to meet obligations, but still a lot of money. And that opens up doors in terms of financing, bond issues, um, and it sort of gives a little bit more credence to the idea of when a, federal, when a bond is issued with the federal government involved, the role of full faith and credit of the United States that, you know, there's, there's a backstop to your investment in the case of losses, that, that pooled risk and that huge amount of capital sort of helps to ensure that. And so there's been, they've been able to leverage that in a variety of ways, and we can get into more of that as we, as we go on. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add is in terms of the federal role as well. When federal funding for transit really first started, it was a lot of times focused on the capitalization of transit systems, or I should say recapitalization of transit systems. So at the time that this all started, you had transit systems that were really freaking old and falling apart disgusting buses, trains that were really, really gross, and in some cases still on the rails in New York City. Um, and that never really changed. There was no recognition that the fact that there was overcapitalization occurring from all this um, has been a factor. And so when you look at it both ways, there are some who say, well, that focus on buying new buses, buying new trains, and buying new interiors for vehicles, that sort of thing, is really important. That should be the focus. And I'd say it's probably more on the, on the left, if anything else. But you have someone on the right who would say, cut it. You have others who would say, well, look at it as an operating subsidy instead. We can get more into the nuances of that. But actually fund day-to-day -day operations, labor costs, running buses in every two minutes rather than in every 20 minutes, things like that. Um, just to push, push back on that a little, I think um, in terms of that capitalism, can you hear me okay with this thing? I can also yell. Um, <laughs> Is, is that that overcapitalization has been the direct result of the federal subsidies, right? In that projects are massively expensive to build and they are more expensive because of that federal backstop. That places are more willing to take on risk that they probably shouldn't. They're more likely to transfer money straight from the federal taxpayers to local property owners, right? Because when the feds are paying for stuff, you have no reason not to demand every mitigation side payment that you possibly can for every project that comes along. Um, and as a result, transportation projects are far too expensive, far more expensive than they should be. And we're not even talking about high-speed rail here. I mean, it costs almost $200,000 to put in a stoplight. That's a lot of money. Uh, and David Levinson and I at the University of Minnesota have sort of been having an ongoing conversation about where those sort of creeping capital costs have come from. But some of it has to be rent capture, you think. And with that, with the bottom line of what Teddy's saying is that if you do overcapitalize, you don't really do transit companies any favors by letting them overcapitalize, which is where we are, right? You let them build a system that they can't afford to run. And as a result, you have, you know, train service to far out suburbs. We, those suburbs are very happy that they got their little piece of the pie. But it only runs every 35 minutes so that, you know, the car trip itself costs 35 minutes. And so as a result, it's not really a useful system. And what you should have is a much smaller, much less capital intensive system that's more focused on the high density areas of cities that you then run every five minutes. 
right? So it's basically the London model of transit. Mm -hmm. Margie, do you have something to add? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, there's also a discussion about public sentiment and public tends to, the public tends to really like these big projects and that's what gives us, uh, the political sort of heat behind it. Um, can you speak to that? <laughs> um, well, you know, there's sort of an old saw, and this is and this is this is politicians on both sides of the aisle. It does not matter what party they come from. People love to get their picture taken with shovels and with big scissors as they cut ribbons, <laughs> right? They love these, and so you walk in and you'll meet with some politico, and you'll see his wall of shovels. <laughs> yeah, and hard hats. Yes, um, in that. You know, this is one of those things is in a universe, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but in a universe where people associate governments with waste, right, the world of operating subsidies to sort of get at that every five minutes, it's just a very politically difficult thing to do because people see that money as going to the unions, going to the public sector unions. They go it to see, they see it going to deal with wasteful bureaucracies that, that don't, you know, sort of have a, a motivation to, to, very, to keep their eyeballs on their operating costs and to keep those operating costs low if they know they can always ask for, for more. So there's, there's sort of the political question and then there's, that gets into sort of the voters of, you know, of course, this is your tax dollars at work. See my big shovel? Instead of, the buses run every 20 minutes instead of every 30. Everybody's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? You know, so you know, and it, and it is a very perverse cycle. It, it really is, and in some respects, it's been extremely damaging to transit. Now, the the argument from the other side, I think, is you have to have these big shiny systems. They have to look good. They have to look effective. They have to be clean. Otherwise, people won't take them. And the more voters you can get to put their bottoms in a in a train seat, the more likely they are to vote for your operating subsidies the more likely they are to see their fate as locked into whatever transit is serving their region. And there are reasons to think that as well. We had a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. Go ahead, Joanna, go ahead. Yeah, um, one thing that really seems to be missing from this discussion, and, and you did, Lisa, uh, point out this user fee concept of tolls, but you know, we've heard about the suburbs and overcapitalization in terms of transit, but what about the overcapitalization of, su of, of suburbs? I mean, the Atlantic Cities talks about that quite a bit, that our suburbs are actually a product of subsidizing roads, not charging as pay-per-use of those roads. And there seems to be a kind of disconnect by the voter in the suburbs to say, gee, you know, we're not willing to fund transit projects, but we're willing to harvest the benefits of really what is a socialist system of roads and highways, because I get to, and all taxpayers get to pay for those roads and highways, but how much they're used is really up to anyone. And that's why studies consistently show that no matter how many lanes you put in, you're going to be filled to capacity, which is a telltale sign that we have a real problem here. So why isn't anyone willing to stand up and say, look, if we're really about market-based, because I haven't heard this in, the, in this discussion. If we're really serious, any of these politicians, any of these people, about market-based, we've got to start talking about tolls on the highways and pay-per-use. Not only because you know, it costs money to build those roads, it costs money to maintain them, but there's a huge other cost associated with cars. If, any, if an alien were looking down at any city and saw one car going 80% of the way of all the other cars and they only branch out of 10, they would ask themselves, why is this happening? And we should be asking ourselves, why is this happening so inefficient? And, and none of that, none of the politicians, none of these people have been willing to say, look, we really need to address this head on. Oh, I can speak to that. It's very unpopular amongst the people. Oh, well, I can actually speak to this a little bit. Um, you know, one of uh, Newt Gingrich's eight principles back in 2009 was user-based financing. And he uh, made this sort of blatant statement that kind of knocked me 
on my backside because I really didn't think this was a political truth. He said, you know, people in the suburbs are ready and willing to pay for more efficient use of their time through tolls. And I was like, say what? Because every time I bring it up, people get mad at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but just the, the fact that he, and he you know, no, like I said, you can't say that he's boring and he's always willing to be edgy. Um, the White House has also been very active, right? Obama's, one of Obama's arguments has always been essentially that we need to start thinking about sort of changing the way in which it's funded. And that there's been a lot of initiatives at the federal level, and we've looked at a bunch of them, right, that sort of start looking, you know, sort of examine the notion that we're actually going to do more dynamic pricing in the United States that's, that's very focused on this idea of trying to help us sort through the congestion problems that we have on and overuse on these major highways. And so it's not off the table entirely. I'm just pretty sure that it's not a way to be popular right. in, an exec, in an election year. Also, it's, oh, it's, oh, I'm sorry. It, it, but in my opinion, the the conversation is much is, is much better now than it was yeah. a decade oh, ago. So it's there, but it's just highly, highly unpopular amongst voters. So you're 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 not going to have many leaders that are going to take that risk to put that on there. To, to make blanket to make blanket policy statements, but I think in terms of like real proposals, once they're on the table. Um, that are sort of presented in very sophisticated and marketed in very specific, uh, sophisticated ways. I think that is very much different than it was 10 years ago. I mean, when I talked about this stuff 10, 20 years ago, I would start you know, waiting for the tar and the feathers to come out, right? And politicians would just shut you off, right? And now we're in a world, and, and, but this also has some real consequences for this idea of federal versus regional, right? Because you do have very ambitious plans in Chicago and San Francisco, both for extensive tolling. Right, but, and and that would basically fall right in with. Is his name John Boehner or is it Boner? Boehner, because I keep calling him Boner, and I know that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> it's that kid from Growing Pains, like 20 years ago. I want to do it all the time. Ba Boehner. <laughs> that, that to him would be the apotheosis of why essentially we don't need to have federal fingers all over tolling policies, right? Because you could actually implement that at the regional level. It would go straight into regional coffers, and then you could use that to boost up transit within that region and not spread the money out really inefficiently. So it's here. It's a it's a problem that's it's it's it's, it's a policy tool that's not going to go away because the problem itself is not going to go away. And when people sort of, you know, the Atlantic Cities folks could call me and say, you know, why aren't you talking more about how unjust suburbs are? I'm like, you know, a little bit like, you know, complaining about gravity. They're here. The roadways that serve them were built with a very specific revenue tool. And I can't build you brand new transit systems unless you sort of point me to where the new money comes from, to where you say, we're going to we're going to use that revenue recycled from tolling to, to boost up transit, which is what they did in, Lon in, in London, or we're going to seek funding at the state level, or we're going to boost the gas tax and say, too bad motorists, you know, you've had your share, we're going to now pursue aggressive transit funding. Those are all viable solutions. But I can't build you new systems where my state and local governments are at fiscally right now. They're just in too much trouble. They're in terrible trouble. And most transit companies are in dire straits. And the next couple of years aren't looking any better for them. And high energy prices also hit them very badly in terms of their operations. So it's an important conversation to have. I don't think it's been as absent as, as you may be suggesting. Well, I, I guess what I would say, though, is still uh, that it, it perhaps should be framed less as an emotional issue in terms of the gospel of cities and more as an efficiency discussion, because that's really what it's about for a lot of residents. Oh, absolutely. It's an efficiency and not, oh, gee, I really love my city, and I want cities to dominate the world. No. It's a completely different discussion. I don't want to pay for their roads going out to the side of the road. Yeah. Part of the other issue politically and also logistically at the risk of coming across is very boring talking about the logistics of tolling. We can see incrementalism happening all around us right now with tolling projects on the 110 and the 10 coming up in the very near future. That requires transponders, gantries, real-time pricing databases, computers, and most importantly, and hardest to find, human beings who are going to be able to understand how those computers work, repair them in real time, and make sure the system flows. And so when you look at just the cost of that up front, and you pair back to an entire region, the gas tax in some senses seems to be just the path of least resistance. But you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Because if you go to say, I'm going to raise the gas tax, people will have your head. But then if you talk about how everybody should have a transponder in their car that tracks every single rotation of their tire and charges them based on vehicle miles traveled, which if you talk to economists is probably the most efficient thing to do, people will also flip out. 
So it, it's, it's trying to work incrementally towards it. And here in California, Virginia, Texas, Pennsylvania-ish, um, you know, there are, that's really where you're seeing most of the tolling activity occur. Um, but it's still, as we've all said, it's, it's sort of a long way from becoming a real, real economic tool to, to correct for demand. If anything, I would say they're going to raise the gas tax more at the local level yeah. by implementing sales taxes or yeah. other types of excise taxes rather than saying, all right, we're going to track your every move uh, from Washington, D.C. Probably not going to work. <laughs> Think of the data I could get. <laughs> It's really tough. I started a firestorm on my blog simply by suggesting that California would be better off if we entirely eliminated the federal gas tax. Right? There's, I mean, people just went nuts, right? Because in theory, it would be possible for us to roll back that 18 cents in Washington, and we could raise our own by 18 cents, and we'd keep it. Right? We'd keep a larger increment of that money here that we could then use on transit here. Um, there are all sorts of really innovative proposals on the table. One of the ones that I think is, a, is very viable and I think people will eventually come back to, tolling is going to happen simply because people are getting tired of sitting in traffic. Right. Right? What you're really selling there, it's not an environmental thing, it's not this, it's not that, it's that people are getting sick of not being able to get home with any sort of regular schedule. Right? But we also might see a universe where we start to see more local option gas taxes. Right? Not just sales taxes, but also local option gas taxes. If you think about it, there's absolutely no reason why someplace like San Francisco couldn't, couldn't charge $2 a gallon if they wanted to, and then sink that money straight into their own transit. But you'd never get a $2 increase at the California level, right? Because people in the Central Valley would rightly go, ah! Right? And so, you know, we've become much, I mean, our regions in the United States are unbelievably economically powerful. The tax bases are enormous. And you can actually raise quite a bit of money at the regional level. And I think that's the heart of what a lot of anti-federalists are getting at. That really, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to have this very hard, emotionally wrenching um, national discussion about what our priorities should be. You should let these regions just unleash their own economic power. You know, if people want to have that there, let them pay for it. There's no reason why people in Montana should have to pay gas taxes so that Dallas can have a trolley. Well, also, in addition to that, a lot of these tools that you are talking about in terms of the local gas tax, local taxes, to the micro-local level of block by block, street by street, or cul-de-sac by cul-de-sac in some cases, um, those tools are already out there, and they're already employed. And they're not exactly, they are innovative and they aren't. Yeah. It's just the fact that no one's really employed them all that much. The idea of you know, measure R here, or other similar types of taxes are very much well applied. So it's sort of a matter of just drifting into that model, I would think, with, ta with gas yeah. taxes. And well. unlike tolls, they're easy to pay. Right. Right. I mean, sales taxes, you pay at point of purchase. You pay them a little at a time. You don't have to go to an accountant. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons why these types of tax tools, even though they're regressive and there's a whole bunch of things you can critique about them, are much more popular with voters than the idea that you have to go, you've got to get a transponder, and then you've got to sign up for a service, and then if that service doesn't work one day, you're in trouble and you're going to get a ticket, and then you have to negotiate the ticket with, with the cops and not the te company. And right, there's, there's just a lot to recommend that. And, and it does get to this idea that you create a big pot of money, and you can do that regionally as well. This is one of the openings for the infrastructure bank idea, right? And when, we didn't talk about that very much. I'll just say a couple words about it to try to help you understand the debate. There are already a lot of infrastructure banks in, in the United States. Most, a lot of states have them. Uh, so the idea of using the Measure R money, the, the, the 30 and 10 plan, for those of you who pay attention to this kind of stuff, for Mayor, Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villagorosa, 
um, has gone to the federal government and said, look, we've got 30 years of, of sales tax revenue that are coming. Our voters approved this sales tax measure. Why don't you loan us the money? In 10 years, we'll just push up our construction plans and you know, we'll take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of people out of work because it's a recession and we'll get lots of things much more cheaply by sort of pushing the, the construction sooner and we'll get more people on more transit sooner. Let us do that. You guys fund us the money for that. And in many respects, it's a wonderful idea. In other respects, for people who oppose another government-sponsored agency at the federal level, ask some very good questions about why can't you go to the state of California to do that? It still has very good bonding. Uh, terms, and why can't you go to any of the international funds who are willing to spend money on infrastructure to do that? Um, there are some international funds that are getting very interested in putting private money into infrastructure. You could also go to the European Investment Bank, as we were talking about last night. They, money, they loan money to Vietnam or you know, the Caribbean. It's basically just nationalism that has got us to this point where we'd have to get money from our own government for this. So, you know, it's not necessarily a no-brainer the way people keep talking about it, right? What is the apparent no-brainer is that regions like Los Angeles and New York and D.C. all have a tremendous economic potential to raise their own revenues. Who should basically be the body loaning them, right, the money that they can leverage against their economic principle is, is a lot murkier, right, than necessarily, oh, it should be the feds, right? Um, oh, public transit and environment. Oh, you know, we've spent years selling public transit based on environmental concerns. Um, it's been a way of getting money out of voters who have no intention of setting foot on a train. <laughs> right? You know, people who sit on the freeway and go, all the rest of these people should be on public transit. <laughs> right? Um, the problem is that um, the environment as a rationale has really become a hot button issue. For many people on the right who just sort of see this as the, the left's sort of pat, unthinking, like little trump card, right? Oh, it's good for the environment. We must do it, right? And I understand that impatient because, you know, I've watched a lot of really terrible transit investments go forward, things that were just appalling wastes of money, which sat empty for 15 years before we ever, I mean, there are probably more people sitting in this room than are sitting on the gold line right now, <laughs> right? And we've spent a lot of money on that. Right? And you sort of have these things that are sitting empty for 15 years. We're not fooling anybody when we say that that's stopping global warming. Now, it may be helpful in another two decades, and we may still want to do that investment, right? It may still be a very important mobility investment because in another 30 years, there'll be more people on the gold line than there are now. And so it's probably worth doing, but it's hard to sell it based on the environment when you've got people making those critiques of it. Right? I mean, it, the bottom line reason why you should care about public transit is it's a good way to get around in cities. It's cheap, it's good for students, it's good for older people. It's, we don't have these kinds of long, drawn out, emotional, oh, it saves the environment arguments about things like collecting trash in cities, right? Or having the streets swept. And I see transit very much in line with those services, right? It's something that we provide because we want to help people get around without having to own an expensive car, without having to look at ugly parking lots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so in, in reality, right, President Obama is a very urban president himself, right? He is, his experience in the city of Chicago, uh, I think in many respects influenced him about how well cities can run if their transit service runs well. And in all reality, CTA doesn't really work that well, <laughs> right? It, it's really not that good. It's out all the time. There's all sorts of outages. I mean, you, you talk to the average CTA rider on a given day and they're pissed, right? Because chances are something happened to them. In general, though, it's pretty good transit, right? 
but he, he sees that this is really important to the economic and social life of cities, and, and he wants this for American cities. And I think in some respects, it's a real question for postmodern presidents in the urban world that we now live in. If you watch our French president, right, Sarkozy, he acts more like the mayor of France than any other politician I have ever seen. He sponsored design competition for Paris. That is not what presidents do, they run nations. But it gets into this idea of sort of what is national policy? What does it mean in a world where most of our population and most of our economic productivity occurs in cities, right? Where, where political peoples, like political peoples, politicians, <laughs> like um, the mayor of New York and the mayor of London and the mayor of Los Angeles are international players right, because of the economic power of the places that they live, about what does it mean to be president in that world? Do you explicitly adopt urban policy, which is what a lot of countries have done, or do you sort of try to struggle in the way that Obama has struggled with suburban and, and rural constituents who have handed, his fanny, handed him his fanny in a number of dust ups in the Congress, Congress where we still have disproportionate representation from rural areas? It's a real conundrum, right? I don't know if that was a good answer. All right, it's the answer that I had. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Or... He yeah. had one. Yeah. You touched on this a little bit in your most recent answer, but <clears throat> what do you think, if you're looking ahead, say, 10 years, 15 years, as the baby boomers age and start to be unable to drive, how do you think the politics are going to change of um, whether it's transit or transportation funding or gas tax or those needs? Because if you have this huge, you know, bump of people, that are not going to be able to drive. I mean, you know, I think about that with my parents a lot, about where they live and how they're going to get around. Um, they don't the evidence from that, I, I think this is a hard question, simply because when you actually look at the way elders behave, each of them, each generation behaves differently. Um, the evidence that we have so far is that people prefer to age in place. Um, we have a strong narrative from the very hopeful people that say, oh, they're going to want to give up their suburban homes and live in downtown environments. And that just doesn't mesh with the data. And it doesn't mesh with any of the older folks I know who see those kids on skateboards as a broken hip on wheels. <laughs> right? You know, they just, it's, it's not clear that our urban environments are particularly well suited for elders either. Right? If suburbs don't fit them, I'm not sure that, that downtowns really suit them either. We have a very agent, ageist society and a very ageist built environment that's reflected in that. Um, my prediction, if we're going to put on my little skylarking hat, is that I think people are going to move out of the big expensive metro regions when they no longer need to be economically tied there. And if their kids are as mobile as this generation seems to be, you've got one kid in Seattle, one kid in, you know, out in the middle of nowhere in Washington, D.C., or Washington, and another who lives in L.A., like your family, you know. Um, there is no reason necessarily to stay in your own house. Many people do seem to. But for people who are mobile, they're not going to be moving from their suburb to their downtown. They're probably going to be moving to mid-level cities that have very good medical facilities, like the Roanokes and the Iowa cities, and those kinds of places where the bus transit is fine. Right, a bus trip doesn't take you two hours because you can walk across the city in two hours. Um, <laughs> the housing is outrageously cheap, you know, you sell your house for a million five in the very expensive region that you live in, and you move to someplace like that, and you have PhD doctors in the best health care that you're going to find anywhere that's easily accessible. That would be what I would do. I think that that's probably a good strategy. A number of those places have actively developed really comprehensive, like, nice lifestyle communities for people who are older. Um, and so I see the movers doing stuff like that, and then I see the people who want to stay in their house, pretty much staying in their house, wherever that is, using it as a place to keep their grandkids at Thanksgiving for all the extra room that they have. Um, this is an affluent group of seniors for the most part, um, even though they've had a number of economic shocks. Um, so they'll do, all, they'll do all sorts of things. They'll take taxis. They'll hire somebody to deal with their lawn. They'll hire somebody to deal with their, I mean, the lady that owned my house before I bought it died there at the age of 100. And she just had the financial means to have home care and all sorts of things. Um, so that's what I see. I don't necessarily see the one narrative being true. What do you guys think? You, you skylark for a bit. I mean, in the long term, this is not so much related to aging as it is just general trending and the fact that people are using transit more and more. 
I like to knock the gold line too, but today at 7.30, it was packed. I don't 7.30, have a car. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always on the gold line. And then even late at night, when they yeah. go down to just the four train cars, it's still pretty full. So the usage is rising, at least when gas prices rise. And it's always interesting to watch on these trains when you, I like that ringtone, it's nice. It's very relaxing. It's fine, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the usage is rising. And so as usage rises, you need more connectivity and intermodality. And right now in the LA area, there's so many individual transit systems. The city of Santa Monica, Culver City, Pasadena has its own little bus line, obviously Metro, um, Foothill Transit, you go further and further south, Long Beach Transit, and of course, magically, we all require exact change. So <laughs> that makes it difficult when you're 60, 70, and you know, you, you, you just don't necessarily always have exact change, you don't have the patience. And between that and the fact that just more people are using transit, we're going to start seeing better connections. I think you're going to see transit consolidation as sort of Metro playing Pac-Man and growing larger in terms of its influence. I firmly believe that just based on the logistics of it. And I think some of that will be driven by the seniors who are going to need you know, better bus service. We can't provide paratransit for millions of people at a cost-effective rate. So, I think that's all true. And I actually think that gets to be more the case the more devolution of funding that we do. Absolutely. Because when you do something like that, then suddenly the more voters you have actually sitting in the seats. Right. Right, and you have people. You don't have to have this sort of discussion at the federal, at the state level, where the rural areas are sort of saying, "There's nothing in this for us. There's nothing in this for us. There's nothing in it for us." When you have it in an LA conversation, you have a New York conversation where the politics around transit are much, much different. And I'm not picking on that section of the gold line. I'm picking on the other one. Maude, do you have anything to add or takeaway message today? Um, I guess uh, back to the environmental comment, I think you could, and I, I may be wrong, um, argue great environmental benefits from pricing measures. I mean, I yes. think there's a strong environmental connection there. Um, so transit, no, it's a very, very hard argument to make. But in terms of pricing, installing hot lanes, you, could, you will see environmental benefits. Oh, I wouldn't, I, let, me, let me caveat that statement, not caveat it, but mm -hmm. fill on it. Um, I think you absolutely positively have to have transit if you're going to price anything. Well, that's yes, true. Absolutely. Yes, there's no right? And then I think you do get environmental benefits yeah. from transit. The way you get environmental benefits from transit is you get people's bottoms in the seats. Yeah. Right? But right now I live in a world where driving is cheap and transit is cheap and driving is pretty ubiquitous and you can park everywhere you want to and your life is pretty made easy and gas is cheap. People whine like a swarm of gnats when it goes up by a couple of nickels. Right? I mean, in that world, how am I supposed to get transit to compete with that? And so if I can get enough, if I can price people out of their cars and get them to, they, I gotta have public transit to give them some other way of getting around. Otherwise, pricing vehicles becomes a very vicious circle um, where there are people put at a distinct disadvantage even when they get to save time and even when they do benefit from it, you know, in terms of being able to save their time. Um, so in concert, right, we would get a lot more environmental benefits if we actually did pursue a, a portfolio of strategies that on the one hand made it relatively more expensive to drive and relatively much easier to take public transit. Um, anyway, I'm going to be done now. I think we're out of time. So I want to thank our panelists, Teddy and Moja and Lisa. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> And uh, lastly, I want to thank um, the Unruh Institute and Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. And next week, we have a very interesting topic. Kirsten, do you want to talk to us about that? Special interest in politics? There aren't any of those out there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so join us next week, and uh, thanks for coming. Alrighty then. Hi.